Hello, everybody. So, this is my first live stream in a while. Um, and if I'm going to be honest, I'm uh, looking for somewhere on the screen where it tells me how many people have joined. So, there we go. I can see that somebody's joined the stream. So, that's awesome. Um, so, I think I'm just going to natter for a little while um, while we. I'll wait for a few people to to file in. Um, if you're if you're joining us, like if you could drop a drop a, a, a comment um, in the chat about kind of where you're where you're joining from. Uh, I'm hoping this is going to be a regular series of live streams. So we're going to be streaming. Um, I, currently, the plan is to stream this time uh, on a Wednesday most weeks. Um, certainly, when I have the time, um, and we're going to be focusing on Python and MongoDB. So um, yeah, anything, ev anything, and everything around developing with Python and MongoDB. So uh, today's session is going to be quite Python heavy, I think, uh, and not quite so MongoDB heavy. So we'll be talking about some of the conceptual stuff when working with MongoDB, but really we're going to be sort of getting into the weeds and some into some Python code. Um, I've I've got plans uh, for doing PyTest integration um, with MongoDB uh, in one of the coming weeks, and um, potentially we'll be looking at optimizing your um, Visual Studio Code setup for working with Python and MongoDB. So those are, those are some ideas I have for uh, coming up. But um, also, if there's something you you really want to to learn around Python and MongoDB, like drop that in the chat, and any any kind of inspiration for for future streams be much appreciated. Uh, and I can see um, Winston in the chat at the moment from Malawi. So welcome, Winston. Um, glad to have you here. Um, so just just going to give it a few minutes to get started, allow people to come in. Hi, Peter. If there's if there's anybody I've actually met, so I, I, certainly in the past I've travelled to quite a lot of Python conferences. Um, I just got back from um, JangaCon Africa a couple of weeks ago. That was very exciting. My my first time really in Africa, so so that was very cool. Um, uh, DjangoCon Africa, really total success. It's the first first DjangoCon that we've had in Africa, and uh, it was an absolutely fantastic conference. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, so you got Winston and Peter so far said hello. Um, if there's anything in particular that you're you're here to learn, like like let me know. Um, my plan today is to start building out a library. So in the next few weeks, I'm planning to build out this library. Um, it's a, I think it's a kind of new idea uh, for an object document mapper. Um, and yeah, I'll explain it in a minute. Um, and, then, uh, and then we can get started into the code. So, uh, Hi, Everest. Great to have you here. I think this is a really nice thing about running a stream earlier in the day is that the time zones work really well with people in Africa. So it's, so it's, it's great, to, great to have you here. Um, right. Um, I tell you what, I will share my screen um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get started. So I'm, I'm a little bit rusty. I haven't actually done a live stream um, for nearly a year now. Um, so excuse me if things sometimes take a little bit longer um, to get up on the screen um, or whatever. So I have, I'll have i share the window rather than just the tab. Um, so really, the, the idea around the library that I want to work on today, um, so it stems from some training that we were doing internally in MongoDB um, a few kind of weeks and months ago. So um, we have we have a, a few internal training courses that we do to make sure that the people who work in developer relations at MongoDB really hopefully know what we're talking about when it comes to the right way to use MongoDB, the right way to design data um, in MongoDB. Um, and uh, a lot of it, honestly, stems around this concept of design patterns. Um, which I, I've got up on this tab here. So this is this 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 is a bookmarked uh, blog post um, or, or uh, article that we have um, on the MongoDB website, uh, and really this is where a lot of the sort of deep knowledge in how you build um, database schemas with MongoDB 
kind of where the, the where it's where it's written down. Um, so I think there's one of the one of, almost one of the problems with working MongoDB is it's really easy to get data in. Um, you know, it's really easy to get started, and with a small database and with relatively light load, that's going to work well for you, right? If you if you start with some with with effectively some JSON documents, you then load into MongoDB as BSON. Um, the problem comes when you've got lots and lots of documents um, and lots and lots of requests, and maybe then you're looking up across collections, um, or you're not indexing efficiently. Uh, or you just haven't modeled your data for the kind of queries that you're doing. And so those are places where sometimes the performance, uh, you know, you know, that, that, that can be a pain point as you um, have more experience working with MongoDB. Um, so really, this the, the, and, and a lot of the ODMs don't necessarily help you. So an ODM is a library um, that kind of acts as an interface between you and MongoDB. And most of them do some sort of version of data validation and converting documents into classes. Um, but they don't do a lot to translate the data that you have in the database into the kind of structure that you want in your application. So sometimes you'll be modeling data um, for efficiency like in quite a different way in the database to how you actually want to deal with it in your application. So that's kind of what I want to look at is how we how we model that that difference between like what's in the database, what's in your application. So that, that's my plan. Um, and I can see Winston in the chat here has said that he's had some tough times working with MongoDB with Django. Uh, and honestly, that's, that's a relatively common story. So um, Winston, let me know if you were using Django to do that, because I know that's a very common way to interface between Django and MongoDB. Um, and certainly from my own perspective, I've been kind of moving away from that as a recommendation. So um, Django is really built around a relational model. You know, it's uh, this idea of, of relatively sort of restrictive tables and joining data across tables. And relational databases are optimized for that. You know, they're really kind of, they're designed for you to um, flatten your data into various tables and then kind of recompose it when you do your query. But that's really not going to get you uh, the benefits of using MongoDB. You can use MongoDB as a relational database if you want to, but that's, you know, that that's that's not really the, the power of the document model. Um, the document model allows you to embed uh, related data or embedded data within a document and have this kind of hierarchical structure uh, of things inside the document. So I think kind of trying to um, force Django, which is very related, you know, it, it's a Django, all the applications that you integrate with your, with your when you're building a Django app, um, most of them come with their own models. And those models are designed to be stored in a relational database. And I think trying to trying to sort of munge those into a MongoDB database is maybe just not the right way to use MongoDB. Um, increasingly, I'm recommending that if you're running Django, you take advantage of the fact it has this highly integrated uh, ORM built into built into Django, and you store that in a relational database. But if you have a MongoDB database that where you want to expose that data into your application. Uh, or you want to want it to kind of you want to be able to store stuff in it to take advantage of MongoDB's document model, then you access it directly. So you just you you configure your connect your MongoDB connection, use the client directly. If you prefer to use an ODM to abstract that, like, that's cool. But don't try to swap out like the relational data that you're storing um, with. Uh, with MongoDB, with with some sort of fake SQL interface like like Django gives you. So that's that's kind of been my experience um, and the experience of some of the Django developers I've spoken to who've been using MongoDB. It's like it's just tight integration with that framework is is never going to be like the best way to use MongoDB. I think. Uh, I hope that helps. I hope that helps, even if it's just sympathy, <laughs> kind of saying maybe maybe that's not the best way to do it. Um, so uh, moving back to the use cases, so we have these these sort of high level patterns that we've identified, and these are essentially solutions to data modeling problems. So um, document versioning um, is probably the most ubiquitous one. So uh, document versioning is designed to solve, and we're going to be looking at it a little bit today. Uh, it, it's designed to solve the fact that you might have a massive database with billions of documents in it, um, and you might actually need to store 
documents with two different schemas in the same collection. So as your data evolves, you can't necessarily do a big bang migration. You don't really want to necessarily, because that sometimes takes your database offline. Um, and, and sometimes these things are essential when you're working with relational databases. Um, with MongoDB, we have the power to store documents with slightly different schemas inside the same collection. And so we can, we, we have a, a whole bunch of options about how we migrate the data. So in theory, you might never migrate data in an older document. If you're not touching it or not making changes to it, then, then there's not necessarily any need to change it to your new, new schema. Um, you can make changes every time you read a document. So if a document is actually in use, then you just may bring it up to the latest schema at that point. Um, you can uh, update on write. So when you're saving new data into a document, you just bring that up to date so that you're storing it in a, in a sort of newly standardized schema. And you can kind of combine this technique with having some sort of background script that's just gradually rolling, uh, making rolling updates to all your older documents um, in the background, so that eventually you're kind of bringing them all, all up to date to your your latest version of the schema. So yeah, it's uh, I I think this is one of the the real highlights of of how powerful MongoDB is. The fact that you have these options about how you how you work with your data. Um, there's also things like extended reference. So extended reference allows you to um, essentially do a join. So you might have two pieces of related data. Um, but an extended reference, instead of just saying, well, my data is here and all of my da related data is in this table over here. And if I want to look up any of the related data, I have to have to do a join um, across tables. Um, with um, MongoDB, you can, you can store a subset of that data. So if it's a comment, you might have a whole load of metadata. You might have revisions if somebody's edited different versions of a comment, things that you don't necessarily want to display in the page you're looking at. But you do want to display, say, the username and, and a subset of the comment. You can actually store that in the first document and have a link to the second one. So you're duplicating some data there, but that means you're not then having to recompose your data with every query. You're not having to do a join across two collections or two tables or whatever, whenever you to, to build your single blog post page. You can have all of the data that you might ever want to show in a blog post just in, in a single document. Um, so uh, yeah, there's so schema versioning, uh, or, or rather document versioning, is the one um, that I actually I think I may have been talking about schema versioning and not document versioning. I think this document's been uh, been updated since I I last looked at it. So that's exciting, isn't it? Um, so the previous versions of a document. So yep, I think this is this is uh, we were actually talking about schema versioning. Um, so yeah, and as I said, it's ubiquitous. So just about every application can benefit from it. Um, so uh, I'm gonna restart off with some relatively low level stuff today. We're not even gonna be looking at MongoDB that much. So I'm gonna be using a dictionary as a kind of abstraction of a MongoDB document. Um, and then I'll show you how we can change the way things are looked up uh, in the underlying document um, sort of through, through some Python metaprogramming techniques. It sounds scary, but it isn't. Uh, I hope it isn't anyway. Um, and then we'll see how far we get. I, 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 we're kind of already 15 minutes in as I've been wittering through the introduction. Um, hopefully, if anything that I'm saying uh, doesn't make sense, uh, then just let me know in the chat and I'll try and refer to it every so often and, and make sure that that people are, people are sort of keeping along with what I'm talking about. Um, so let me just share um, VS Code, um, which is my current editor of choice uh, and so there we go oh, yep you should be able to see my visual studio um, editor at the moment all i've got here is a readme at the moment there's some stuff i'm just going to paste in that i've written before um, just to get this project started um, so this is kind of my readme uh, if you check in the the stream description, you'll find a link to the repository that I'm working with. It currently only has this readme in it. Um, hopefully by the end of this stream, I'll be pushing up some some Python code uh, that we can we can work with. Um, so the aim today is not necessarily to have a fully working library, but at least have to have a, a structure to build things on later. So the idea is that that 
I want to have um, a, a mapping layer that abstracts the fact that I might have different documents under the hood, um, different different document schemas, um, and but I want them to be presented in a single view uh, within the application. So um, let me just stick in a, a, a Pi project Tommel to get started, and I need to set up an environment. Let me bring up a terminal. Um, there we go. Uh, this banner here, MongoDB, don't make me do that. That's something that I did myself. <laughs> just, just a, a, a MongoDB fan. I like to like to have it remind me who I work for every time uh, I bring up a terminal. Uh, so this is my directory. I've got my README. Um, I'm just going to pb paste into um, a Pi project Tommel, um, and then I oh, sorry I switch between the term. I don't really use an IDE in the way that I think you're really meant to. Uh, I tend to switch between the terminal and uh, the text editor. Um, so this is this is actually so I gave a talk at EuroPython and um, some other Python conferences a few years ago about packaging. Um, but I used to use setup tools, and obviously these days there's a whole uh, plethora of different packaging tools. Um, and so I'm I'm experimenting with Hatchling on this one because I've heard good things. Um, and here is really just a sort of this, this used to be a setup.py file or a setup. Uh, config file. Um, so it just kind of describes the project. I've got readme. I should. I think I need to put something in here to say that this is a markdown file, actually. Um, I'm aiming at relatively modern versions of Python because that makes life easier. Um, and then I need to look up the uh, latest version of PyMongo. Um, excuse me while I search my browser window. Uh, so we've got four six at the moment. So let's just stick that in here. I'm going to be relatively strict with the version at the moment while this is under development. And then later on, we can kind of work out the compatibility um, of different versions. Um, so I think that's actually the only thing I require at the moment. Um, notice this SRV in square brackets. So that just, as well as um, installing kind of core PyMongo, that's going to install all the dependencies necessary for connecting to Atlas, because we do some quite clever stuff with DNS um, to connect you to your cluster, and it just requires an extra an, an extra library uh, on the client side. Um, and then, hopefully, this will build. Oh, uh, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip the packaging step for today because I think this is maybe a distraction from what I really want to get to, um, and I will um, come back to that later. And I'm just going to, at the moment, I have a, a VN. Um, oh, and I'm using PyEnv. This is always the way, isn't it? As soon as you start um, start actually trying to demonstrate stuff to people, um, so I think I might already have PyTest and PyMongo installed, which are the two things that I want today. So uh, let me just check through PyTest. Oh no, I don't have PyTest installed. Um, I'm just going to install that. Um, pip install. Whoop. You can see some of the stuff I've been playing with recently. It's very exciting. Uh, uh, pip install. Uh, PyMongo SRV and PyTest. There we go. Um, so uh, PyTest, great. It's not going to find any tests because I haven't written any tests yet, but it's a good way to get, get started. So I'm, uh, I like working in a source directory. Um, and I'm going to call this dot bridge. That's all good. Um, and I'm going to make a directory for my tests as well. Um, and I'm going to start with a test file. Uh, my good friend, Harry Percival, who wrote uh, ooh, this test driven development with Python, he'd be very pleased with me right now. Creating this file before I've even created my source. Very good. Uh, touch test. Oh, should have been tests. Um, let me know if the text is too small. Um, so I've got a question from uh, Museka in the chat. It says, I suppose I have a schema named farmland and three schemas, single farmer. Uh, so uh, 
I guess, Masika, by schema, you're talking about a, a document or a sub-document. Um, I, I think the problem here is that I don't know the similarities and differences between them, and I don't know how they relate to each other. But I guess what you're really talking about here is the how you join farmland to farmers. Um, and the answer is, it depends. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, so um, you can obviously stick farmland in another collection. Um, and if you expect a farmer to have lots of farmlands, farmland documents, uh, that or that the sometimes the farmland is related to more than one farmer, then um, that might work well. Do look at, use lookups to, to join your data back together. Um, but I think in general, <clears throat> from my own sort of preconceptions of this, this schema is I would um, I would probably embed the farmland um, inside the the farmer documents, um, but it really depends on how you're looking up your data. So if every time you look up a farmer, you're going to want um, want to know what farmland uh, they own or run, then um, then it makes sense to store them together. Um, if you if you're very rarely going to want the farmland back and you're more interested in the farmers themselves then uh, then you might want to keep them separate so yeah it's it, again like these are the kinds of things where you can model it a couple of different ways um and uh and see which perform better for you uh, which make your queries easier to work with which ones are easier to model um i think i i mean that is the extended reference if you were going to store them separately but maybe have a summary then then um you would store the commonly viewed farmland data uh, as part of the extended reference. So it's really just about which subset of the farmland data you might want to view uh, when you're viewing a farmer. Um, so I'm just going to get back to the back to the Python code. Let's because I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking and we haven't actually had a, a, um, a look at the code very much. Do let me know if the text is too small. Um, so I have this dot bridge. This is a package. So I'm going to need an init file in here. Um, and this is uh, time to get started. Well, let's let's let me explain kind of my well, let's first stick a class around a document. So I think my my initial plan is um, excuse me a moment. I've got some notes on another screen. Um, and it's kind of, it's lost them. So just let me fix that. Um, okay, and we're back. Um, so I'm going to have a class. This is kind of a base class. So it'd be something in Django, it would be called model or something like that. I'm going to call it document. Um, and the idea with a document is that it, abs it, it, it sort of sits as a wrapper around a MongoDB document, which is a dict, right? That's that's the way we represent them in MongoDB. Um, so uh, I'm going to say that this should be as well as self. I'm going to forget to put self in there at some point. I've been programming Python for 23 years, and I still sometimes forget to put self in there. Um, but let's just say I, it's got this sort of doc dict um, internally. And when you instantiate one of these, it's just going to sort of store it on itself in a, a private um, uh, private field attribute. Um, and then... If, so that's that's kind of a start, and we might instantiate that with. Um, uh, let me just put this in as some sort of test code. Uh, I'm bouncing icon on my screen, but I'm assuming it's all good. Yep. Um, so when, if I if I instantiate this, I might say, uh, uh, let's say I'm using my cocktail database. Well, um, And I pass it my cocktail. Ah. Um, my act. This is what I would get from PyMongo if I did a query. Um, and then 
let's say that cocktail has a name. So that, let's say the cocktail document looks like. And this would be an old fashioned, kind of a, a simple but very popular cocktail. Um, or series of cocktails, really. Uh, and then let's just say if I wanted to print out the name of that cocktail, this this is a very simple mapping, right? This is this is now I'm doing an attribute access on a on an object, but I want it to look up the the field in the underlying document. So let's uh, the, the way that we do that in Python, um, and it's possible you've already done this um, with your own code. Uh, um, there's a magic uh, method called get uh, atta, not get attribute. So get attribute. I don't know why it's not self complete. It's not auto completing the thing that I'm actually looking for. But that one that it's, it wants to auto complete to, um, it it <clears throat> it's it's done first. So it, it so it intercepts any request for an attribute, and then this gets called instead. So we don't want that. What we want is is one that's done. We want. Um, when I access an attribute on, the, on on an object, I want it to do a normal lookup, and then I only want it to do this magic lookup if that thing isn't actually defined on the class. And then we're doing something slightly less magic, right? This becomes a full fallback um, for, for attributes that aren't implemented on the class um, instead of just sort of intercepting that whole mechanism of looking things up. So um, let me finish this off. Uh, when this is called by Python, um, it's called with self, as most methods are, and then it's called with the attribute name. Um, so we can do whatever we want to with that. I could just uh, return the attribute string. So if I looked up dot name, it would return the string name. Uh, that would look like, but that's not very useful. So uh, instead, let's look up the attribute in the document that we stored. Uh, um, so there we go. I'm going to pass the name on to the dict that we stored away uh, and then return that value. So actually this, I'm going to, I'm just going to run this. Um, so I'm, yeah, let me, it is not very happy with the version that I'm using. Uh, oh, well, let's, let's just try it anyway. Um, Python minus M, ugh, and it's in the source directory. This is this is one of those things we're not setting it up as a package. I'll show you how this works next uh, next week um, when I've tidied it up a little bit. For, for the moment, let's just go into the source directory, uh, and I can uh, minus M doc bridge. So this will just run that file. Whoa! <laughs> uh, so that's always a good thing. This is actually usually a danger of using get attribute that we get this maximum recursion depth. Um, so I'm looking up something on the document. Woof, I, I have no idea why this has happened. This is very exciting. Um, so I'm just gonna do some old school print debugging. Um, I'm gonna print out the actor that that we're looking up, and I'm going to print out what the self underscore doc is because that that's kind of weird to me. Um, um, look at that line repeated nine hundred and eighty four times though. Uh, so hopefully, ah. Oh no, this actually shouldn't be. So um, what I, I was talking about the difference between get at and get attribute. Um, but we actually have this. Uh, get attribute would intercept this request because I'm looking up something on myself, but get at doesn't. So anyway, the correct way to do this is um, to call get at a um, self dot. Oh, actually, no. I don't know if that's going to work. Tell you what, let's just uh, print that and return none. 
So hopefully that will get rid of the, no, nope, that hasn't got rid of the recursion. If anybody has any thoughts in the chat, feel free to let me know because I'm just I'm really stumbling over something that um, was actually only meant to take a couple of minutes. Um, let's print out self just to see. I mean, that's a, oh, that's that's something else as well. Um, So I'm printing, I'm looking up underscore doc. Um, and then it seems to be looking up something called name. Um, oh yeah, there, because I'm looking up name. Uh, so why am I looking, I, have I got this the wrong way around? Is this meant to, I don't think so. But... Um. Oh, I haven't actually stored anything away. There we go. And that's why it was calling it, because it hasn't actually saved anything on the local document. Okay, there we go. Um, self doc asset. Document has no attribute name. Oops, I misspelled that. Woohoo! There we go. Done my name lookup. Um, so now we have something that looks like a class, but looks things up in a dictionary. Um, it's not perfect because it only works with, um, uh, with names that are valid for, um, for Python, um, variables. So for example, like, um, a field name in MongoDB could contain a space, but a property name can't. So I, I, if it was like full, full, if it was stored as full name in the database, uh, I, I couldn't look it up using this technique. But for the moment, let's just ignore that because I have plans to build in the ability to map um, properties to uh, document field names, um, but we're just not there yet. Um, right. And then, so now uh, uh, this is kind of, a relaxed way of looking up data. Let's, but the, the, the problem is, let's, we don't want necessarily our data to map directly between our object model and um, the data in the document, as I mentioned before. So we might have a version two of this. Um, and in that case, maybe the name is like, maybe, maybe there are two names, there's a full name and a short name or something like that. So in th that case, we've looked at this and we've gone, name isn't the correct name for this field. It's now called full name, but we still have some of the older documents sitting around. Um, let's call it co cocktail document one and cocktail document two. So as I said, like imagine you've got billions of these things and you, so you can't migrate them all in one go, but your application has to keep working. So you're going to have, um, and if you're sensible when you're starting your schema, you start with version number, to even start with one, um, just so that you can select uh, easily between the different versions of your, your document schemas. Um, so I, I might, but let's just say, I want to be able to look these up as name. Um, my application expects cocktails to have a name. Um, and so what I want it to do is essentially do a sort of fallback thing. I want it to look it up on full name and then if full name doesn't exist, I want it to look up on name. So well, although this is going to look a little bit more like a Django model. So when I create a doc, I'm going to subclass document. Um, and we're going to call it cocktail. And it's going to subclass document. Whoop, there we go. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to say I've got this name property. So we're not automatically just looking stuff off on the dict anymore. I'm now say like configuring this name field. And what I want this to look like is like, um, let me see, it's, uh, we'll call it, call it a fall through um, because it falls through different field names. 
And this is going to take kind of full name and name. So it's going to try full name first. And then if that doesn't exist, it's going to fall, fall through to name. It's going to assume that they're kind of, they're both strings or that whatever they return is useful to the application. We could do some kind of conversion. And again, that's like a feature I plan to add to this library later on. But for the moment, let's just start with this one feature. Um, so now I'm going to put these in a test in a moment. Or, uh, maybe I won't actually, because I haven't got the packaging working. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, so I got cocktail one. So that comes from the, the version two document, uh, ironically. Uh, and then we've got cocktail two, which is uh, hasn't been updated yet. And this will be uh, from the, the version one schema. So this will be martini, but it's also stored under name instead of full name. So the, I want these these lines to, to work, to continue to work. Um, so if I, yeah, this isn't going to work at the moment because I haven't defined a fall through. So let's, um, we talked about briefly about how we do lookups in, or how we can intercept lookups on objects. So get at a, is a function that's called when you're doing a lookup, if that field doesn't actually exist on the class. Um, so, it, and in this case, it's done after that field lookup's done. If, if, you, if you implement get attribute, it's the first thing that's called. Get attribute, actually, the implementation of it basically says, do I have this field defined? If not, call get atter. So that's the thing that ends up calling this, this magic method. Um, there's another way that you can intercept attribute lookups. And it's the mechanism that's used by property. If you use the property decorator, you've used what's called the descriptor protocol, um, which is the thing that I'm about to describe. So the descriptor protocol says that when you look something up on a class, specifically a class. So here I've defined a thing called name on the cocktail class, um, and that's of type fall through. So I'm just going to let's start defining fall through. Uh, and at the moment, just leave it empty. Normally, it will just return it. Um, so in this case, uh, if I if I look up name, I should just get one of these fall through instances. So if I I think I can run this code and it's just going to print fall through twice. Oh, uh, fall through doesn't take any arguments. So let's just define an init. Um, and uh, and I'm just going to store this. Okay. Um, let's try that again. Cocktail dock is not defined. So I, this is just me being silly. Where have, where have I missed that? That is on line 22. Uh, oh, I mean that, that doesn't help. Oh, it's up here. And that is, oh, well, I, I've done, I don't know what's happening today. This is, uh, this is just typical when you're actually showing, showing people things. So uh, now we have um, this lookup of an attribute um and it's saying key error name <laughs> this is like <laughs> the problem we had before uh so yes uh i wonder what happens if i get rid of that now so th i wonder if this is interfering with what we're trying to do this went much more smoothly when i prototyped this um so document object uh has no attribute name that's true is it true Yes, so here we go. This should be a cocktail. This should be a cocktail. There we go. So it's printed full through twice. And I think I can put this back in. This is not interfering with the code. It was just to give me a weird error message. There we go. And that's because this thing is just returned. So it's stored on the first, it looks it up on the instance. If it's not on the instance, it looks it up on the class. And I have actually defined it on the cocktail class now. So that's what it returns. But there's an extra mechanism um, here called that's part of the descriptor protocol. And that says if the thing that you're looking up, the fall through, um, has a method called get, 
Um, and it takes uh, two, three parameters. It takes um, the class, no, self of CLS. So it's, um, yep, it takes this instance. So this full through instance, it takes the object that the full through is attached to, and it takes the class that it's been uh, attached to as well. So those two things can sometimes be different. Um, and then, it's, so basically, it's the descriptor protocol, it's part of the Python data model, um, says, if you implement this, it will be called uh, by the Python. Um, so when you do an attribute lookup, it, it, when it, it's just about to return the full through. But at first, it says, it, does it implement under, under get, this underscore method? Uh, and if it does, then it will call it and return the result. So here, um, I can look up the document. Um, well, let's, yeah. So I'm going to go through the field names and one by one, I'm going to look up the item. Uh, so first I'm going to go through the field names. Um, then I'm going to try to um, look up those field names in the underlying document. So the underlying document is this, but it's stored on the object. So I'm going to go ob dot doc. Oops. Uh, and I'm just going to return that. Uh, and if it fails uh, with a key error, because it's not found, um, then we're actually just going to continue. We're just going to um, ignore it, because we expect not always to find it in there. Um, and then if we get to the end of this loop, um, which is that technically what the else is for on a for else, I'm never quite sure whether I want to use it or not. Um, but if it, yeah, it just basically means I tried all the field names, um, but none of them worked then. So we basically want to raise a value error here um, and give it a useful message. So I'm going to use an F string, uh, oops, attribute. And then the attribute name is, uh, oh, where do I get that? Um, it's self. Oh, I haven't. <sighs> okay, let me come back to that. Um, attribute attribute doesn't exist. So the problem I was just about to put in the name of this full through. So in this case, it would actually be called name, or it could be, you know, I could have called this full name or whatever. Um, but actually, the full through doesn't know what it's called yet. So that's something we can fix in a moment. Um, so this this should work actually with uh, two examples. There you go. So now the first one is looked up as uh, full name, um, and then the second one's looked up as name. So now I've got this sort of single interface over two different classes, and it's really just defined here. I'm just saying, look, name is not always the name. It's you know it it could be called something else. Um, and in theory, I could have some sort of function that sort of recomposes it. So if the name was originally, if, if let's say it was a user, um, we might have one day, we, we might have originally stored the name as first name and last name. And then we might want to um, store them like later on a later schema might combine them into one field. But we don't have that on the older documents, but we can still produce it, we can generate it on the fly if, the, if it doesn't already exist. Um, and at that point, you might then want to save it back with, as part of the new schema. So it's like if you're, especially if the generation is costly, if you're doing some kind of calculation over data, then you only want to calculate it once. Uh, that's actually the pre-compute pattern that's in that um, the, the patterns document that I, I um, linked at the start. So uh, we got full through. Um, now the problem I have here is that it didn't. It just says attribute doesn't exist. So let's say uh, this doesn't even have a name. Let's use a French French word for name. Um, so now we're going to get a value, and it's it's not very helpful, right? It doesn't say I was looking up name and I didn't find it. Um, what you want to say is you're looking up name, um, and I tried these field names. So I have the field names here. But another part of the, this is a newer addition to Python. I forget exactly which version of Python 3 it was added. But one of the other sort of underlying magic methods is one of the, these fields can say, when I'm, uh, when I'm assigned to a class, tell me what I'm called. And that's, uh, you, you, you 
define a hook for that called set name. And that's just going to say uh, owner. So this this will be the cocktail in this case. And then um, I, I wish I hadn't used name because this is now name. And this will literally be the string name here. Let's call it cocktail name. And then that, that hopefully simplifies things a little bit. And then we we'll use that down here. Uh, and then I'm just going to store this. Uh, on the field, uh, name equals name. Uh, and then when it doesn't exist, I can say attribute um, self dot name. Uh, and I can do bang r, and that'll, that means it will use wrapper to turn this into, to, to sort of serialize this into a string instead of just using um, stir, which is what it normally does. So let's just check that attribute cocktail name doesn't exist, um, or let's say was accessed, but the underlying fields, and then we'll just look up, we'll just print out the field names. And again, use wrapper. Uh, wrapper's Unicode safe as well, so that's nice. Um, Key error cocktail name. Why am I getting a key? Error? Oh, uh, that's interesting. Self dot field names, and that is oh underscore field names. So that's failing. Should work now. Uh, don't exist. So there we go. So the thing, the, the 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 real inspiration for building this library was when we went through this training and we worked with this problem over four days, where we were supposedly dealing with an enormous data set. We couldn't change the data. So uh, yeah, and we built up more and more code, and it was kind of hacky, right? It was it was a lot of custom code to deal with this evolving schema underlying the application. Um, so Museka, if uh, if you're looking, Michael, my colleague Michael has just asked you a question about why you'd have three separate schemas, which I think is a, a good question. Um, I'm I'm guessing it's like an inheritance thing where they sort of share a sort of key pharma characteristics, but there's, then there's some sort of differences to the schemas underneath. You'd, you'd, I'm assuming you'd store them all in the same collection, because I think that's probably the way I would go with that. Um, but I look forward to, to your your update there. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I didn't want to have custom code. I want reusable code. These This particular problem here of sort of um, falling through different names in the underlying document is quite a common problem, I think, or quite a common uh, pattern. Um, there's also uh, casting types. So this is, um, I'm, I'm going to create a new field type called simple at the moment. This is all very, I'm kind of evolving it. And I wanted to do this in public so I could get people's feedback as it's, uh, as it's evolving. So I'm, I'm going to call this a simple field. May change the name of that later. Um, and this one's just gonna gonna take a name. Oh, actually, is it gonna take a name, or is it just gonna look up the underlying field? I'm quite decided. Um, let's let's make it take a field name at the moment. Uh, name, and then I'm just gonna store that away. Self dot field. Oops. I feel like there's lots of um, sort of recurring patterns here. Um, and uh, so I, I think if I, as I start to see these evolve, as I build more of these fields, I'm going to try and consolidate them in either a superclass or some sort of helper helper function. So that's just the way that this is just sort of the way I design software to try and make sure that it's intuitive to use. Is I start with the simplest solution possible, and then gradually find those recurring patterns and try to refactor them um, into the design. Uh, so here, uh, I'm going to do a similar thing. So I'm going to implement get. 
Um, and I'm just going to return the first, uh, the one field name that I've got, but I'm going to provide a function to, to transform it. So one of the things, uh, we have some sample data sets. One of them is a movie data set. Um, and there's a field in there, the year, the year a movie was released. Um, and sometimes it's an int and sometimes it's a string. And I think it's been purposely designed that way so that the it's a, it's a kind of a, a created problem um, so that uh, uh, you 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 solve it when you're sort of working with the data, and that's what. So that's kind of what I'm planning to do here. Is I want to be able to attach a function to one of these fields, um, and uh, and have it automatically transform the field data as it as it comes through. So let's just we'll check that in. Uh, we'll check that this works in a moment. So uh, there's my get. So that is literally just returning the underlying field. So let's create some data. Uh, and uh, we'll update the data here. Um, tell you what, let's work with the version field. This is a terrible thing to do. You would never want to do this in real data. Um, but now I've got a version that's a string and a version that's an int. Um, and I'm going to print them out. Um, but I'm going to, I'm just going to do, am I going to, maybe I'll print out the type. Oops, there we go. Um, so this should hopefully print out str and int for, for the two different documents that I'm looking at. Uh, but first, I have to actually configure it. So we have version equals simple. And we'll just have it. Uh, now, I could actually have it auto uh, default to looking up the same field name. But we'll, um, I'll add that later. I have quite a bit of code that I've already generated that some of it's quite mundane. And so I'll make sure that that's put into the repo like within an hour after this, this stream. Um, so there we go. Simple has no attribute field name. Uh, and that is because I've obviously stored it wrongly. Uh, underscore field name. Oh, OK. Um, I mean, that looks all right. Oh, I've done it again. I actually forgot to do the acid, uh, the assignment. There we go. So there we go. It prints out str and int because we're getting different types back. So let's say we want to force those to be converted to ints, um, and we want to do it in a nice reusable way. Well, there's there's a function that takes a string and converts it to an int, and uh, it's just part of core Python, and it happens to be int. So uh, let's let's say the way I want to configure this is um, what are we going to call this? I don't know if I want to call it conversion. Let's call it transform. Um, I think, think that works quite well. And what is, it's going to store this function away. So if you work with Python much before, functions are objects like uh, pretty much everything else in Python. So you can store them as variables. You can pass them in the parameters. So that's what I'm doing. Um, and then in simple up here, I'm just going to, there's going to be an optional variable. Um, so transform. None, um, and then we just store that away. Self so transform, transform, uh, and then when we get it, we'll actually uh, we'll apply it here. So value equals. There's a more elegant way to do this, but I'm going to do this at the moment. If transform, oops, don't know why it did that. Never quite get the completions that I'm expect. Oh well, I mean, of course, I'm not accessing it on self. Is not none turn transform dot transform. And now we actually call this function. So in the, the configured class that I've got, this is going to be int. Um, and then we're going to pass it the value. And then it's just going to return whatever was converted. And otherwise, just going to return the value as it is. Um, so hopefully, this will do the conversion now. And in both cases, we should have int. There we go. Uh, and then if I print, uh, I can print the, the actual value as well, which might be quite quite good. Um, just to show that we're actually getting the value out of it. And I have to update that to two. So there we go. They're both ints and 
you know, they're, 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 they're the actual values that I asked for. So cocktail one and cocktail two, uh, which ironically have switched around versions. Um, but I, hopefully you can see that this, although this code, the document simple and fall through implementations, there's a reasonable amount of code there, but it's reusable. This And it's reusable through this kind of declarative configuration in the code. So here I can say I've got a cocktail. It's a type of document. And then I've got these two attributes. And I want to be able to map in different ways. So fall through, we'll look up different fields in the database, in the, in the document, sorry. And um, version will transform any, any values that are stored in the document into an int before returning them. We could do some validation here. Um, I my, my plans in the next few weeks are to build uh, an automatic joiner. So we're going to implement the extended reference pattern in a way that's transparent to the user. So it's not actually, I'm not sure it is the extended reference pattern, um, but it, it's, you should never have more than 200 items uh, in, a, in an array in MongoDB. It's just an inefficient um, way to store sequential data. Um, so you want to start bucketing that up into different arrays, like different documents that you will then look up um, in order. Uh, and so sometimes, let's say you've got a blog post with lots of comments in it, you'll store the first 200 in, inside the document, and then you'll have another document in the collection that has the next 200, another document with the next 200. And so you're actually looping through documents in the database, but also looping through sub-documents within each of those. Um, and I'm going to make that happen automatically. So the idea is when you start looping through this array, it's going to transparently start pulling in extra documents from the database. So that's the point where we really start to abstract away MongoDB rather than just abstracting around a document. But I think I wanted to start with the simple stuff first. Um, so, uh, Everest has asked if poly polymorphism is supported on schemas uh, on the realm object models. Um, and I'm afraid, Everest, I am uh, not one of our realm experts. Uh, but what I can recommend is if you look at the, the description um, in YouTube uh, for this, uh, this stream, um, we have a link in there to the MongoDB community. And if you go through there and ask that question, you'll get one of our experts at MongoDB or perhaps somebody from our uh, broader community um, will, will answer that question. It's a really good question. I just, I'm afraid I just don't know the answer because I don't tend to work with our mobile um, uh, uh, stuff. I, I was a mobile developer many years ago for, for about eight months and, and uh, I've forgotten everything that I learned then. Um, so we thought, I've got two minutes left of my one hour slot. Um, so it's been, uh, thank you very much for joining me. I hope this was useful. Um, do check out the GitHub repo. There is only a readme on there at the moment, but within like minutes of the end of this uh, stream, I'm going to start pushing up uh, the code that I've demonstrated to you today and also a few other things. Um, it's mostly undocumented at the moment. Um, I'm I'm going to write an introductory blog post to the library introducing what its aims are uh, and I'll get some code documentation up uh, shortly too. But hopefully this has been in, an interesting sort of tour through some of the some of the ways that you can use Python metaprogramming. Uh, we've used uh, getatter. We've implemented a descriptor that that does um, attribute access and um, has its name set by the class where that is attached to. Um, as this goes further, as I said, we're going to be abstracting out some calls to MongoDB, but I don't plan to separate us away from PyMongo too much. It's like, I like PyMongo and I like the aggregation framework. And I don't think that we necessarily need some sort of magic query language that sits on top of the aggregation framework. Because I think aggregation pipelines, once you get used to them, are quite readable and relatively easy to work with. And I'm going to show you some techniques for, uh, for building those pipelines in reusable ways as well, using functions to build up the components of the pipelines. So I've got a bunch of interesting stuff planned. So I hope if you enjoyed this, uh, you'll come and tune in um, about the same time next week. Um, and I, as I said, I think I'm going to implement a PyTest um, plugin next week so that we can start actually requesting stuff from MongoDB, saving stuff back to MongoDB, all within transactions uh, and making sure that it's actually, actually storing the data that we want. So this becomes more of a real world MongoDB uh, interface 
um, uh, at, at that point. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me. Uh, hope to see you soon. I'll see you next time.